All right, uh, we'll uh, just get started. Uh, topic today is uh, over the air software updates without downtime or soft service disruption. Uh, I'm Ingve from uh, the Include OS Unikernel project and uh, I probably think a few of you have, uh, we have got this feedback already. Just what is Include OS and what is a Unikernel? We'll get back to that, but uh, first we'll uh, take a step back to last year. If you were here last year, or if you have seen the session videos, you will remember a topic that came up in Linus's uh, keynote chat uh, last year. IoT is unpatchable. There are millions of devices running outdated software with no way to update them. This is, of course, a serious risk for security vulnerabilities. And in theory, all devices should update automatically. But in practice, it's uh, often complicated time-consuming and requires manual intervention. Okay, we are in 2017 now. Can you send a guy around with a USB cable to update devices manually? No, not really. Updating should be automatic and unattended. And when you have thousands of customers, you can't send a person around to do this. Also, attended and user-initiated updates do not scale at all. Look at the numbers there, 1.4 million cars. Recalls are incredibly expensive, so your CFO gets mad, and there are total logistical nightmares because you have to schedule all these uh, things to get them updated. It's really, really hard. So I'm from a project called IncludeOS. We are uh, making a unikernel operating system. And uh, we actually provide updates without uh, downtime or service disruption. IncludeOS started as a research project. It was uh, done by a person called Alfred Bratterud uh, from Norway and a team of uh, researchers. Uh, the, these are some publications that have been published. Uh, the project is open source, uh, Apache licensed. Uh, it's mostly written in C++, the biggest bar on the <laughs> top there. But don't worry, you can write in C if you prefer. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that's a screenshot. Okay, uh, let's go for an overview of the operating system landscape. Back in the good old days, we had two main types of operating systems. We had the embedded operating systems and the general purpose operating systems. They were quite distinct, so uh, they are drawn quite far apart here, just to indicate that uh, they did not really speak the same language. After a while, we got the virtualization. You could consolidate multiple servers on one physical machine. That was oblique obviously a simplification, but it was quite useful. After that, we got containers where people realized that they were running multiple servers and they did not want to share the entire OS. They could just share the kernel. And include OS is a unikernel. So uh, let me give you a few points about uh, what unikernels are. Uh, it's not a new concept. Uh, MIT worked on so-called exokernels in the mid-90s, and there are many other current ones now. You have uh, Mirage, uh, which is written in OCaml. You have uh, OSV, which is uh, written in Java. And you have uh, Rumpran unikernels. They are written in C and mostly based on BSD. This uh, concept is also known as a library operating system. Unikernels are single purpose. They can be used for a lot of purposes, but only one purpose at a time. They are absolutely not designed for your laptop. Your laptop needs a general purpose operating system. Your laptop contains lots of devices, runs lots of programs. Unikernels would be a very bad idea. But in the cloud and in IoT, you often have servers doing just one thing and still they have their own full-blown operating system. The web server over there, 
It's just doing one thing. It's serving web pages. It does not really need a full general purpose operating system. So in order to achieve that, we make a library operating system. And your program or service will pull in whatever it needs <coughs> from this library. And this is done, all the OS functionality is compiled into a static library. This contains everything in the operating system, uh, including drivers, but uh, they are in their own libraries, not in the OS.a file. At link time, the linker pulls in just what the program needs. So if you write an HTTP server, but not an HTTP client, you get the functions dealing with serving HTTP, but not about getting HTTP. So you can add lots and lots of functionality to the library. You can add so-called bloat, but it doesn't matter for your final image because your image will only include what it actually uses. And uh, there is an extra, extra tool at the end of the tool chain which attaches and uh, modifies a bootloader. Include OS is mostly designed for virtualization. You end up with a bootable disk image. It's 100% self-contained and you run it in your fi favorite hypervisor. The hardware looks like this. There is no emulation on modern CPU CPUs. Instructions in the virtual machines are performed directly on the processor. Also, no code is shared, so virtual machines are basically hardware-protected sandboxes. Here you see some devices. Some are virtual, some are physical. The oper operating system does not know whether they're physical or virtual. So you end up with one image, and using your favorite hypervisor, so you can use Kimu with the KVM acceleration, you can use VMware and VirtualBox, and the same image runs on Linux, Mac OS, and Windows when you're testing locally. And the exact same image that you tested locally can be deployed to OpenStack, to Google Compute, and on vSphere. And Again, this is the exact same image. So all the testing you did locally is valid because you're testing the same code. So what does this look like? Here's an example. Looks pretty much like a normal user space program. This shouldn't be very scary. So if you write this, you can uh, test it in your uh, local hypervisor. You have to do some uh, the first time you have to do all the CMake stuff and uh, that's kind of boring, but after that you just do make and make your changes and make again. And then there's a command supplied, which is called boot, which builds and runs the image. And this is in Kimu uh, using a KVM acceleration if it's available. Now, if you prefer VMware, you just ex uh, change the command, the exact same service gets run in VMware. Or if you prefer RetroBox, you uh, can run the same uh, image, but here you have to add a logical name because uh, VirtualBox gets confused if you uh, add the same image m multiple times. But of course, uh, the end destination for these images is usually the cloud. So if you want to deploy in OpenStack, uh, there are the raw commands. Again, you just do make and you end up with an image there. And then you use native uh, OpenStack commands to uh, upload the image and boot it in the cloud. Uh, there's also uh, an OpenStack uh, wrapper script, so uh, you can do this with a one-liner. And just to get a size of uh, uh, perspective on the size, uh, here's a comparison between Include OS and Ubuntu. This is not a very relevant comparison because these are very different operating systems. This is just to give you an indication of the relative differences in size. Typically, include OS images are 300 times smaller. They use about 100 per times less memory by default. 
and this is obviously uh, quite a big uh, reduction in attack surface. For you guys sitting in the back, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, the gray bars are Ubuntu and the blue ones are include OS. Uh, a minimal image with the networking typically comes in at about 1.5 megabytes and a real web server with the REST uh, API support and modern features like parsing JSON and stuff like that ends up at around five megabytes, I think. And that includes static content that is served by the web server. Include OS is single threaded by default. That sounds weird for some people, but there are benefits. This really reduces complexity and the native APIs are asynchronous, but there are some blocking uh, POSIX calls provided for backward compatibility and porting. If you were here yesterday, uh, there was a competing operating system and they had the same story. You, you need some POSIX. So here's an example of uh, what the code would look like if you write the typical TCP server. And don't worry, you don't normally write this. The uh, include OS comes with batteries included. So there are uh, already uh, user-friendly HTTP server and client libraries provided. But here's an example. And as you can see, you have a typical callback-based interface. Here you have three callbacks, so you end up with a bit of nesting. But again, there are pre-made libraries, so you don't have to see this junk all the time. Being small is uh, quite useful for uh, reducing attack surface. Here we have a general purpose operating system and you see you have your service, you have shell, you have daemons and background processes running in there. And even if that was the whole picture, that would be pretty bad. But in reality, you also have lots and lots of shared libraries. And Bugs in shared libraries are a very common cause of bugs these days. In a unikernel, your attack surface is reduced to this. There's no shell, no daemons, no background processes, no shared libraries. So you cannot attack what isn't there. Okay, now you know a bit about the unikernels, so it's time to get uh, philosophical. Why are we here? And I don't mean that in a metaphysical sense. I mean very practical. Why are we here? If you could look at your badges that you're wearing around your necks, you will see these logos. Open IoT, Embedded Linux. Now I've told you about ImpluteOS. We're not Linux and we're actually not yet used for IoT. It's a very use case driven project and uh, most of the work we have done has been on cloud deployments. But it turns out we have the same problems. We also need better ways to do updates in the cloud. Hopefully you heard about Mender. Some of them are in the room. Uh, they have had uh, two excellent sessions and the booth in the pavilion up there. And uh, they released Mender version 1.0 this week. And when we heard about their solution, we thought, hey, we can probably use that. Because cloud and IoT, yeah, we are in different sil silos, but we often have the same problems. For example, we are working on a high availability uh, system that requires live updates. And Mender provides uh, upgrade management it works with full image updates, which is what we want for atomicity and reproducibility. Uh, because we upload, upload a complete image, an image that is identical to the one we tested locally. So we thought, hey, maybe we can use a solution from the IoT field. And we have actually tested it, and it worked quite well. Uh, I will show you a demo soon, but first I have to introduce you to something called Acorn. Acorn is actually an integration test for Include OS. It brings together uh, many, many parts of the operating system, and it's a web server with uh, REST uh, API support. It can serve uh, static content. Uh, you can uh, serve from a memory disk or a virtual block device. 
There uh, you can do a post uh, if you want to uh, store some data and you can uh, serve static content. And this is the dashboard in Acorn. There's a live uh, update. Here you see uh, we, uh, what happens when suddenly 10,000 uh, HTTP requests come in. Then the CPU has to work a bit. And uh, you see a memory map. Uh, you see there is mostly a heap for the application. And uh, you can see the TCP connection status in real time. Also, uh, there is uh, statistics. So there's a centrally located statistics for everything, including a service. And uh, on the side there, there's a timer-based live stack sampling. So you can see which functions are executing. This is uh, very useful for uh, debugging. Also, there uh, is a logging where we have uh, logs. This is a normal standard route, but it's routed to an in-memory ring buffer. Each of the components you can see here on the page are individual REST components. They are written separately. They output JSON, which you can probably not read if you're sitting in back, but that's normal JSON, and it uh, gets processed on the front end. <coughs> so we wrote our own Mender client library. Mender provides a server and a client, but unfortunately not in C++. So we had to write our own. It's uh, not too big, and for users it's really, really quite simple to use. This is the interface we ended up with, and uh, basically you create the client, and then there are two callback methods you need to handle. You have the on store. This gets called before the update, and uh, you need, the application needs to store its data. And then again, when the update has happened, there's an onResume function, and you have to implement that to restore any application-specific state you want to store. The client only serializes its own state, so the rest is up to the service. It's totally flexible. If you want to uh, preserve TCP connections, you can do that. If you want to preserve the rest uh, things that have been entered, you can do that. If you want to uh, preserve logs, you can do that, but you don't have to. It totally depends on the service and the service's needs. Okay, now we're going to try a demo. And I might have to do a little bit of a screen disconnection to get everything set up here. Okay. That's the wrong window. Hmm. Okay. Here you can see the dashboard I was just describing. And um, as you can see, uh, it's updating in real time. We are using very little memory, so there's a lot of heap memory free. And uh, we have set it up like this to be able to see both uh, things happening at once. Here you see some status information about the operating system. If you see the field there called artifact, that's the version, the deployed version of the web server that we are running right now. You probably can't see that in the back, but it helpfully says error February 8th, because this version 
was made on February 8th and it contained an error. Obviously, it's really embarrassing for me to show a version with an error. Thankfully, we have Mender. Here we can see the devices that uh, have registered. If you want uh, detailed instructions about how to use the Mender interface, it's really cool, it's really user friendly, then you should ask the Mender guys and they also have very, very good documentation. Uh, here we have the client. This is running the Mender client. Every 10 seconds, it contacts the Mender service and says, hey, do you have an update for me? And so far it doesn't. But we can create an update. Here we, can you see? It's probably a bit hard to see. Uh, here I'm asked to create a deployment and then I select an artifact name and then we select an artifact that's a fixed version that we have uploaded. And this is called fixed. And then we click create deployment. And hopefully something will happen. The thing is, uh, since the client only checks for uh, updates every 10 seconds, it takes a while. But if you see now in the artifact field, it's now running the fix version. So in the intro to this, we said without downtime. And of course, there is a bit of downtime. Uh, the, ser the server was uh, handling requests all the time, and this was only a cosmetic fix. So there was no reduction in the functionality. But of course, in the time between the polling for the updates, you're still running the old version. It's not like I can force an update from the Mender interface. It's initiated by the client. OK, but what if we want to roll back? Let's say that the fix wasn't a fix anyway. We can do that. We go back to devices. You probably can't see this. I'm sorry, the screen is very small, but uh, here we have uh, uh, the instance is running the version. If you see, the, this is the current software field. It's running fixed. But we want to create a new deployment, and we want to go back to the old version. So we select the error artifact and click create deployment. And again, there's a bit of waiting, but already it's running the old version. The reason this happens relatively quickly, the actual updates is done in around five milliseconds. But again, uh, it only happens when it uh, gets a new update and the polling interval is 10 seconds there. Uh, the entire upgrade takes place in RAM and the image that is uploaded, it's a complete image, so you don't end up with uh, one version of old libraries and one version of new libraries. Everything is changed at once. And the uh, instance that is uploaded is an exact same instance as the one we tested and ran locally. So we can be pretty sure about everything working. And again, uh, now we uh, decided that no, we want to go with the fixed version. We have tried both versions. So we create a new deployment. And we select the fixed version. We create a deployment. And then we wait. And there you see, we are now running the fixed version. That's pretty, pretty seamless. And uh, at least uh, for our cloud workloads, that's actually everything we need. Uh, the uh, Mender client has lots of reporting and campaign management functions. We don't use any of that. So we have a very simplified model. But it works in actual practice, and that's pretty impressive. So very good job by the Mender guys. <coughs> and one obvious question people tend to have about this is, what if something goes wrong during the update process? In the cloud, that's really not a problem because we can just trigger a remote reboot. When we did this, everything happened in RAM. So the backing image that was originally uploaded to the cloud provider is still running. No, it's still stored. So we can always go back to that. 
And obviously, if uh, we did this on a device, we would need to have a watchdog timer so we could uh, make sure that the new version was working properly. And if it doesn't work properly, then you would have to go back to the old version. Okay, so some final words from us in IncludeOS. Uh, pull requests are always welcome. We are really here to get ideas from you guys because you guys, especially IoT guys, you know a lot more about updating than we do. So please contact us directly. You can uh, chat with us on Gitter. You can talk to us on uh, Twitter. Uh, but uh, obviously pull requests are uh, most welcome. If you want to learn more about IncludeOS, uh, I have added some uh, links in the, uh, in the PDF of the presentation. Uh, and uh, the demo will also be added as screenshots because I know it's really hard to see it for you guys in the back. Are there any questions? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? What's your supported architecture? Yes, uh, excellent question. Um, what is our supported architectures? So most of the operating system is written in standard cr cross-platform C++. The only thing uh, that is uh, device-specific is drivers. So the only platform we actually support support is x86. But more than 80% of the code also runs on ARM, but the exact hardware specific things have to be rewritten. Uh, and it, uh, it has uh, just recently been split up, so the code should be very easy. Just you probably need one device driver and a couple of uh, CPU specific things, and you're good to go. Any other questions? No, uh, yeah, the question is uh, how does, uh, when the reboot happens or the update happens, where does IncludeOS start? Does it start from boot or does it start from the saved state? It goes through the entire boot process, but then there were uh, a callback method on resume is called just after the boot process. So there, the client is free to do whatever it wants to do and can continue from where it was, provided it saved its state in the on-store. Yes, uh, excellent question. Uh, the question was, uh, what is the boot time of IncludeOS? And that depends on the service but uh, we are talking milliseconds. Uh, the longest, I think, is around 300 milliseconds, but uh, probably around 180. But it, it depends on the service and what it does at initialization time. Yeah, the question was, uh, does IncludeOS support POSIX? And it supports just enough POSIX. It supports what uh, people have actually needed so far. And we are adding more and more POSIX support because obviously we want to run as much software as possible. But it's not fully POSIX compliant and it will probably never be fully POSIX compliant. There are some things that uh, just aren't relevant in POSIX anymore.
Another very good question. Uh, is Includo a uh, real-time time operating system? No, there are no features specifically for hard or soft real-time. But for many workloads where there are not that strict requirements, Include OS can probably do the tasks required. What about programming language? The question is, what about programming language? And API. Yeah, and the API. And the native API is C++. But uh, it's very easy to wrap with C, and it's very easy to interoperate with C. So if you, you use a language that uh, can link with C, then you can usually use it. There's a question. Yeah, licensing. licensing, yes. Uh, it's Apache too, but, uh, and uh, I'm not a lawyer and I don't play one on TV, so uh, there has been at least one major project that needed some code from Include OS in, uh, with, under another license. Uh, the MAME, uh, arcade emulation people, and th that was uh, handled, uh, they got a uh, license re uh, under whatever they needed. The question is, uh, what, uh, how do you foresee the uh, Include OS future? And we are mostly working with cloud-related things, uh, microservices, uh, situations where you need to uh, put up uh, hundreds and maybe thousands of immutable microservices and you need to boot them quickly and take them down quickly. But uh, it's uh, an open source project. We take any contribution and if somebody is interested in using it for IoT, we would be very, very happy to take contributions for that. But we are not actively working on that right now. There was a question over there. Yes, uh, the question is what do you see as uh, our uh, technological market or area? And uh, so far we have been working very much in the cloud domain. But uh, for example, we looked at update solutions. We didn't find anything entirely relevant. And then we found the perfect solution from the IoT world with Mander. So uh, I think uh, these silos will uh, more and more overlap more and more techno technology will be uh, transferred uh, across products and across uh, markets and, uh, yeah. So, I mean, if I'm doing something at the moment with a point to an Apache on a cloud server, um, I mean, would this translate, would, would I be able to support that to what you're doing with Ubuntu? Okay, the question is if he's doing something with uh, Ubuntu and Apache, could... Really take out Ubuntu? Yeah. Yes, uh, then that depends on what parts of, for example, Apache you're using. Apache is huge, ha has lots and lots of supports and module for, it has lots of modules. I don't know if all of them are supported, but uh, you know, it's uh, impressively big, but sometimes a tangled mess. So if you can work with a simple web server, serve static content, uh, serve up some REST API endpoints, then you can already use Include OS. No, but uh, it's really easy to try out, and I recommend that you download it. Yes, a new question? Yeah, well, what kind of uh, security and libraries are we planning? And again, we are very use case driven. And uh, for example, to use Mender, we needed some cryptography for authentication and stuff like that. And then we use Bhutan because that was easy to port and can be used in pretty much any C and C++ project. And what we have found is that most uh, standalone 
C++ or C libraries can easily just be compiled and linked into InclusiveOS or with some effort be ported. But obviously there are some really huge things like, uh, for example, uh, if you want to do uh, APR, the Apache Portable Runtime, that's going to be harder. Any other questions? Uh, the, the question is if it only supports REST APIs, and yeah. it does not. It supports anything. It supports native TCP sockets. It supports web sockets. Uh, uh, obviously, it's only been used in a couple of projects, so it might not be a perfect, standardized, full, conformant implementation, but web sockets is already in, for example. So if your device can talk via web sockets, it can talk with Pluto as. Any other questions? Thank you. <laughs>